Uh, I'm Melissa Hoffman. I'm the editorial director of PR News. Just want to thank you all for coming. Um, I think we have a great breakout panel down here for you. And um, it's going to be a little more intimate than the, you know, the big ballroom with everybody you know, crammed in there. So I hope you get a lot out of it. Um, joining me here is Kevin Elliott, the U.S. Director of crisis, Risk and Crisis Communications Practice of H&K. And we have Howard Opinski, President of Five Blocks, who will be moderating the session. So I will turn it over to you. Great, thank you. Thanks Welcome so everybody. Uh, don't be shy, there's plenty of seats up front, so uh, come, on, come on forward. Um, uh, we're very happy, Kevin and I, to, to, um, that you've joined us. Uh, we're, we're gonna talk through a number of things. First, I, I wanna um, say Kevin and I are old colleagues and old friends, so this is a lot of fun to be able to be up here with him uh, to share some of, the, uh, some of our experiences. Uh, as Kevin has said to me, uh, when, we, when we started talking about this, it might be a little bit of a walk down memory lane. We try to include everybody, everybody in it. We see some friends and, and, and colleagues and former clients uh, uh, out there as well. So uh, we want to encourage you, at the end, we'll have some quite time for Q&A as well. Um, I'm going to use my phone for notes, so I'm not sending emails to everybody, uh, just in case anybody's checking out there. Uh, but first off, I, I just want to say, you know, from an agenda standpoint, the next half hour, uh, or the next hour or so, a little less than that. We're gonna talk about the flow of a crisis, sort of how these kinds of things break out. We'll talk about some best practices and uh, some differences about uh, incident management today. How is it? How have things changed a little bit over the last several years? Uh, we'll take a look at um, a study and talk about a couple of different cases in particular uh, that we'll go into some detail about. And um, we'll look at what does data really prove about the need for effective response. We talked a little bit about that this morning. We're gonna to touch on that a little bit again here today. Uh, we'll look at uh, the example of Volkswagen and why things went right, and we'll talk about, or went wrong, excuse me, and Emirates, why we think it went right. Um, we'll talk about some of the distinctive differences or the distinctives of a crisis in the B2B space and how that's different from the consumer space. And lastly, we'll, we'll end by talking about some, what are some things that you and your, your, your clients or back in your own operation should be thinking about investing in for the year ahead. Um, so we'll also leave time for your questions, so be thinking of them, and uh, we'll definitely c try to make sure that we get time to take as many of those as possible. But let's dive in. Yep, and to that end, we're gonna move a little bit quick. So if you wanna dig into something, please hit the, uh, hit the, the pause. This is the pause button. Mm -hmm. Just hit the pause button. All right, so. <clears throat> Kevin, first of all, um, you know, whole books have really been bit, written about best practices. We've heard a number of them uh, this morning. I think we're going to be hearing best practices throughout the day. But maybe with the clock ticking here, can you give us sort of your top headlines? Yeah, sure. So uh, I, I, I've been a little bit surprised recently uh, with the number of, of folks that I've talked to that are using an old plan, a plan that's not been managed well and managed recently. Um, we heard this morning, have a plan. I'm all for having a plan. <laughs> but let's, if we've got a plan, let's make sure that we revisit it uh, once in a while. The, uh, the second one is, is look outside the box. Um, and I did hear a lot of talk uh, upstairs uh, earlier about, um, about what I think of as sort of like old school ways of looking at risk. And I think we're in a different place now. We've, we've got to use data analytics to take the subjective factor out of it. We've got to know the risks that exist that, that we could uh, identify as knowable risks, but we've got to look outside the box as well and, and, and find those unknowable risks and, and, uh, and have them database. And then finally, um, anyone who's done this knows that these things never happen at a convenient time. I start worrying on Friday before a long weekend around 3 o'clock because I'm thinking, you know, the devil's out to get me. Well, we um, already heard walking in, there's already a crisis in progress as yeah, we're sitting upstairs. here. So we might have, well, another one here. So you yeah, exactly. Lisa, so yeah. maybe, maybe we'll get a real live uh, fire drill. So, so you gotta, you've got to have a plan that's ready to go and a team that's ready to go uh, in, a, in a mobile environment like right now. We well, you know Mike Tyson famously said, uh, everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face. <laughs> so I wonder if maybe you could talk us a little bit about what it's like when you actually, when, when, when things actually unfold. Give us a little flavor for sort of what's typical here in a crisis, if there really is such a thing. Sure. Um, the, I kind of like this slide. Sometimes I like it, sometimes I don't like it. There's a lot going on. Um, I, I think really without drilling into this in the interest of time, I think we have, um, and some, some of this you heard this morning, um, that most most incidents are of the slow burn, are more of the slow burn variety. 
so there's a lot of time down here on the far, what, on your left, um, and and we recognize the flashpoint almost always. Uh, anyone who's who's done this recognizes the flashpoint, but we've got to get better and smarter at recognizing the evolution to the flashpoint, and that's going back to hit on this again. That's where having good data, uh, a good data based sense of your risks sits because that'll help you evaluate the noise level uh, coming into it. I think the, um, the other thing to say about this, and then we can move on, is, is that the compression in time is, uh, is breathtaking these days. Mm. Things move very, very fast, and, and you, from, from the flash point to some of, these, some of these like critical moments as you move to the right and up, um, the, they can just all squash together. Um, there is there is not there is not a the golden hour anymore. I don't believe in the golden day or whatever you want to put to it. When it's on, it's on. So the best thing you can do is be able to recognize that flashpoint coming, and then and then know that the rest of this is going to be there, either like this or more likely, in a in a more compressed time frame. You know, it strikes me that this is this is uh, sort of built off the notion of the arc of a crisis, and we used to talk about the arc of a crisis, but in fact, it's become more of a steep climb and then a cliff, um, <laughs> is the way that it, and, and this this trajectory has gotten even higher. I, and I think a lot of things have changed uh, as technology changes, as communication changes. How are crises and and issues management really different nowadays? I sort of feel like um, they're they're they're. They're different in a couple respects. I think speed is the big one. Um, I think this notion of evolved expectations, and I saw that um, in a different context downstairs. Um, th the other thing that is that that is unmistakable is that everyone is a publisher, and ev everybody has to up to a point kind of an equal voice. At least at some point, they have sort of an equal voice. Um, and and when it's a when it's a voice of rage, it'll change over time because there are people that have a bigger megaphone, people that have a smaller megaphone, people that have more justification, if you like, uh, more standing, and, and those that have less. But at, at a, there's a point, especially early on, where everybody has a voice. So you're dealing with a lot of noise. Um, I think this, um, this notion of, uh, of evolved expectations, though, is something that should drive you to be thinking outside the box. So, um, so we represent an airline. Um, Things you know, bad things can happen with airlines. They, they can be late. They can they can you know have uh, incomplete flights. I think I heard that term. <laughs> um, but there's a whole lot of other things that can happen that are just human, um, that are not normal for an airline, and we got to be thinking outside the box. So Aon and Pentland have yeah. put out a, a study. Uh, this is the third one I think that they've done, and I know you you uh, and I both find the study fascinating. Uh, it. it gets at the, 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 really the basis of, of crisis and reputation management and why it's so important. Some of the things we talked a little bit about this morning, but maybe hit some of the highlights of that study yeah, for us. Yeah, this woman's name is Dr. Deborah Pretty. She's British, um, uh, she's an, an Oxford scholar, and, um, and she started doing this work when she was a PhD candidate. Uh, I think we met her back in about 1993. I, I was not with our firm then. Um, but came a few years later. We, we sponsored the initial phase of her research. I think she was initially moved by um, a, 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 a graph that a lot of us have seen, many of us have used, that sort of shows the difference between, now we're going back to the 80s, guys, um, so stay with me, we're, uh, between the, uh, the Exxon Valdez situation and the Johnson & Johnson Tylenol situation, right? So a, a good outcome and a bad outcome. Um, and what Dr. Pretty's research has done and now uh, she, her most recent report was, was published in, in August of last year. It's on Pentland Analytics. So if you look, uh, look, look for uh, Deborah Pretty and Pentland Analytics, you'll get, the, uh, you'll get the executive summary. It's got Aon branding all over it, um, but uh, you're free to use it. She's, she's quite happy for anyone to, to see it or use it. Uh, what she's done now, I think she's up over 160 incidents like that. The data is just indisputable. You just can't quarrel with us. And what she's done is looked at these incidents and, and, f and is looking at, um, at the, the way to classify a company that's facing a crisis into the category of either the term she uses now is winners or losers. Uh, it was initially recoverers and non-recoverers. And quite simply, it works like this. If you're a recoverer, if you're a winner, uh, you come out the other side of the incident and you trade at a value, right? So if, if the company's worth a dollar, 
you'll be trading at a dollar and three. If you're a loser or if you're a non-recoverer, then you'll trade at 97 cents if the company's worth a dollar. Now, when you extend that over time and you talk about scale like you, like you have at Exxon or scale like you have at Johnson & Johnson, you're talking about big, 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 big numbers. That's, this is, Dr. Pretty's uh, work is a justification for what we do. It's a justification for what we do. There is no question about the value when, when, when it's understood that to be a winner or a recoverer, uh, the value far more than, than, than covers the cost of, of the function that you have in the organization. It's absolutely phenomenal. She's got it down to sort of five trading days, she says. You can tell within five trading days. Um, I'm not going to argue with her because she's looked at all the data for, for 28 years or something. That feels a little aggressive to me. I, I think I've seen people, uh, you know, uh, even in this com compre compressed time frame, you know, struggle with stuff for, for seven or eight days. But if you don't have your, um, your bag together in five days, you're probably heading in the wrong direction. Well, one of the companies that she profiles and, and she, she characterizes in the, in the loser category in this, in this schema is, is Volkswagen. What, mm -hmm. what went wrong there? Well, uh, and, and there's a summary. Uh, this is, as, as Howard says, one of the cases. Um, the, the biggest piece is the, the transparency around, um, around uh, standards, right? So you, you, uh, you, you go to the, the car lot and there's that sticker on the window that tells you how the car is gonna perform. And we just presume that it's really gonna perform that way, right? We trust them, we take it on faith. And, uh, and that's, what, uh, that's what they were shading course at Volkswagen and um, and the the uh, uh, what, what she says in the in the executive summary that you'll see is that's sort of a minimum standard like, like adherence to publicly accepted standards or publicly required standards if it's a regulatory thing is a minimum and Volkswagen fell short fall short of that I think the other thing that she doesn't take apart as much is the the dribble uh, the dribble effect so uh, they kept releasing portions of data. They, they, first, they, they were trying to, and we talked a lot about this, like don't try to put a, a geofence around a, a problem or don't try to quantify a, a data breach on the, on the first day, right? I mean, because it's going to change. The number's going to change. And, if, and, and it will give the appearance that you were attempting to mislead at the front end. So it was a little bit of that drip drab of negativity that, that hurt folks. Well, my minds. question on that is how much do you think is, because sometimes there's, you know, you start with, I need to know everything that's happening. And everyone's like, this is this is the full situation, right? And you go out there, and then there is more to the story because people sometimes people just feel like, you know what I mean? Like I'm mm -hmm. gonna, you are on a need to know basis. Yeah. Like, I feel like some of these really big things, like a Wells Fargo, I, I wonder sometimes how much of it is they all know the story and they're not saying it, or there's one or two that aren't telling the story, and the PR person is at the whim of. Yeah. I, I know, think that, how much you're sharing. I, I think the tension that happens in those situations, and, and Kevin alluded to, to some cyber events, which he and I both worked on, um, uh, on a couple of really large, high-profile bre uh, breaches, where, you, where at first you, don't, you legitimately don't know the answer. Um, and uh, the, the, the technical folks are still doing the data forensics and trying to figure out exactly what happened. The, the desire by uh, the lawyers, quite honestly, often, and, and by the technical folks is to minimize the situation and to say it didn't, it didn't really impact all that many people. We're 75% or 50% confident that it only affected this number of people and that number of people. And I think our experience in a number of these types of situations is you actually have to go the opposite direction. Right. You have to go with the highest number, the worst case scenario first, and then you have earned the right with that transparency to walk it back. It's when you start small and you start and then have to redefine it larger and larger. Not only have you put out the wrong information, but people just don't, they, they stop believing you with your second and your third and your fourth number. Mm -hmm. And that's something that, we, that, that I definitely saw change over time with these cyber uh, incidences is that more and more uh, um, folks that have been breached were, were starting with the universe. Well, we have you know, 12 million customers, so it's a 12 million person breach, and then eventually they get down to, well, maybe it was really only these 50,000 over here. But because they started off with the worst number, people give them, I think th there's a benefit of the doubt that there's a level of transparency, which was really the big failure, I think, at Volkswagen, was the transparency was actually the problem, 
right? That the, the, they 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 mess with the numbers and the, the, the software to try to try and um, mess with the numbers, and then they compounded the problem by by not being as transparent as they needed to be further on. I don't know, Kevin. What do you, what, are you, what are your thoughts? Totally agree. And if you think about like, would you rather if if you're going to provide some information today, and then you're going to do an update tomorrow, would you rather be increasing your chance of providing good news tomorrow or worse news tomorrow? Hmm. So be be honest. If you don't know what you don't know, you ought to say that. And I like Howard's suggestion that we go with a big number first and say, we don't know, but this is what the universe looks like. So it could be as many as this. Now, you come back tomorrow and say, guess what? Looks like it's small. There's th three big pieces that, that are that are shaved off, so the number's getting a little bit smaller. People start to feel a little bit better, and, and, and to Howard's point, they trust you. Yeah. Uh, are, yeah, to your point there, Howard, are, um, I'm trying to think with Facebook and, and some of the other data breaches, done just what you said they started out small and then a couple of weeks later it's like oops a few more million people were hit yeah, well, oh, yeah, oh, yahoo's the one that really yeah. comes to mind yeah yahoo was the yahoo was the yeah. mother of all like yeah. you know it was the first number was a fraction of what it could have been but it was a, a horrendously big number when we hear like 25 million we're like 25 million oh my god and then the next day you know, like 178 million like oh and then 624 and then 4.3 billion i mean it's like come well on, and it, it, it also adds to the impression that you don't really know the yeah. answer mm -hmm. therefore you don't really know what happened you don't really know what's going on so i'll discount everything else and and, and if there's a, a a maxim that that i've brought to play and a lot of the christ work that i've done is is, is that a, a crisis draws a lot of attention on your your leadership and your management team around things that have nothing to do with the crisis. So if your if your company was in uh, bad financial shape before this happened, um, there's going to be it's going it, to oftentimes it's worse if you if you're not transparent if you don't handle the crisis well because investors just get nervous and edgy that you didn't handle that right and we don't know what else you're not doing well basically. So it's a it, and, it becomes a real problem. And in these, da in these uh, big uh, data things, uh, compounding it, I guess, is that they didn't tell you about the data breach until months later. And then they tell you a number, and then, oops, we have another yeah. number. And they say, oh, but, but trust us, we, we, we fixed it. Yeah. So, so the, the, the tension is around when do, you, when do you know enough to say something. And mm -hmm. oftentimes, um, you, you, you have to, as a communicator, as the communicator, you have to be willing to communicate through the complex through the complexity and the incompleteness, mm. which from for, for a lot of the technical folks is is uh, you know a crime. Well, well, you can't say that. We don't know with one hundred percent certainty. Well, this is communications. It's not. We're not going for one hundred percent certainty. We're going for most likelihood. And from a legal perspective, sometimes you have to try to advocate for for communicating through some legal risk, which um, <laughs> you know that's where the rubber really meets the road. With the lawyers and you have to then come to to a decision about what strategically was I think the interesting thing is, and I'm not a lawyer, but... Uh, Neither am I, the, by the, the way, so don't take any of my legal advice. <laughs> <advice. laughs> is the, the risk doesn't seem to change all that much. The the, the tension, so most most of the, the rules are written from when, when you have a confirmed breach. So you'll have a lawyer sitting there, right. but right behind the, the IT people going, it's still not confirmed, it's still not confirmed, it's still not confirmed. <laughs> and then as a communicator on their side saying, we know we had a problem, we ought to get up and tell people. And... and that, so there's that there's that tension, and I think I think we've got to I think we've got to be um, I think we've got to be really adamant in our in our position. We're the only person in the room. We're the only person in the room that has the public's card. We're the only person that's representing that voice outside, and 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 protecting and and also charged with protecting the brand. So let's do the right thing. So let's switch gears um, and and talk about a good story. And when I asked about a good story, you immediately told me, well, there's a plane crash that I want to talk about. So <laughs> explain that. How, how do you spin a plane crash uh, okay. into a positive story? Okay, this, uh, this is a really good story. Um, and, and, and Emirates had a hard landing um, with, with an airplane at their home airport, so they had a little bit of an advantage because it was on their home field. Um, th what happened here has changed the way the NTSB regulates um, mass casualty incidents. So uh, the good news is, bless you, the good news is there was uh, only one person that was killed. It was a firefighter that was fighting fighting the, uh, the fire on the ground uh, afterward. Uh, all the passengers and crew got off mostly with minimal, um, you know, minimal impact. Um, what, here's what worked really well. This is why I love this. Uh, it, it's it's uh, EK521 if you, if you Google that. Or if you give me your business card or something afterward, I can I can send you this thing that we call a TikTok that we did that sort of 
lays the whole thing out. But in, in a nutshell, what happened was the, uh, the plane came down hard. Um, there, was a, there, was, there were a number of different sources that got the images out immediately, including somebody that was doing a Facebook Live thing. And she's like with her friends going, yeah, it's our airplane, so we're gonna be getting on in about a half an hour and on our way home to London. And somehow the BBC got that tape. I don't know how all this stuff works. But so they're running, the BBC is running with almost a live story of a plane crash. You, we, never, we never see those. They go to this woman, she's reporting for the BBC until they can get a, a reporter to the airport. So she's on FaceTime going, yeah, well, you know, it looked like it came down, it could, the runway looked dry, everything looked good, you know. And you're like, oh my God. I mean, and this is how it's unfolding. Emirates had within 28 minutes, they had an acknowledgement of the incident. That has never happened before. We're, usually it's hours. It's usually hours. Within 20, you can't go downstairs, you're at an airport, you can't go downstairs and get a Starbucks and get back upstairs and get back on your phone in 28 minutes. And Emirates had an acknowledgement out. Within an hour, they had released a statement from their CEO with, is, with, with a number, uh, the number of passengers, uh, the number of crew, and, and they believed at that time that everybody was off and accounted for, but, but they said they didn't know. Uh, within four hours, within four hours, they had, now mind you, in, in, the big, in, the, in the big social media part of the world, uh, we're still sleeping uh, for, for much of this time. Within four hours, they had um, a, a recorded statement from their CEO in Arabic and then in English. And, and they, Emirates controlled the story. Emirates controlled the story on the way this, on the way this story was being told. They, they were the ones that, that, that got to describe the time and place. They were the ones that got to describe the severity. It was Emirates telling a story about an Emirates, a, a very bad situation in Emirates. It, it, they, they had a, a minimal, a, like a minimal disruption in, in their market share, like the, the, the other passenger preference, whatever they call that data. Um, they had no appreciable uh, cost to the company other than the direct cost of, of taking care of the problem. It was handled so well that, that a year later, the NTSB annually meets with carriers and, and folks, and, and they updated their standards and said, we have to now have uh, acknowledgement in an hour. They, they actually gave everybody like a lot more slack than, than Emirates took. We gotta have acknowledgement within an hour, and, and they moved all their standards forward. This is a fantastic study, fantastic case of, of it done right. Was yeah. that just because they were uber prepared knowing this is gonna happen at some point? Uh, airlines always know that they could drop yeah. one or, the, or that yeah. they could have a hard landing. So they think about that and they worry about that. So I think that probably had, uh, I think that was a part of it. I think that, um, I think that Emirates was, was really prepared. They have quite a large uh, communication team uh, compared to what I know of other airlines, other airlines we represent. Um, and I think that was part of it. I think their, their willingness, their, first their instinct to go to social first. And that's where, remember, that's where the incident broke for the public. Forget the, the airplane, you know, coming down on the runway. But the public becomes aware of this via social media. Now, the BBC was right on top of it, but it was still, it was still a Twitter, Facebook thing for several hours. Mm -hmm. And they went right there. And I think that's what helped them stay in front of it. You know, one of, one of the reasons I also think um, they were well prepared is because as a, as a transportation company, they have a, they have a culture of safety. Right. right, you're dealing with a fundamentally a, a fundamental product that has a, a high uh, has a, has a safety precaution. Anybody that's in a manufacturing or transportation, mm -hmm. chemicals, natural resources, these these organizations, many of these B two B organizations, um, ha have this culture of safety that um, I think if it, if you're if you're involved with one of these types of organizations, if you're not wrapping reputation into this into that. Um, culture, you're missing a real opportunity because there's already a forward-leaning um, desire to 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 manage risk, to think about risk, to to do the drills, and and but they're not usually thinking always about about everything. Um, I, I want to use that as a segue, and also because I'm, I'm being given the five signal here, um, <laughs> that uh, to talk a little bit more about B2B uh, and and what makes a crisis or managing a crisis in a B2B environment different than the consumer environment? Yeah, I'll tell you what, the, the, the lessons, the fundamentals are essentially the same. Here's what I think is most important in, in a B2B environment is, is the uh, is the one-to-one -one contact that you that you can have and should have. So if you're if you're Emirates, your consumer facing population is enormous. 
right? If you're any airline, your consumer population, facing population is enormous. You can't call people on the phone or go sit down and meet with them one to one. Um, if you, uh, if you, uh, if we're talking about a B two B environment, you have a generally a smaller set of of customers, a smaller set of economic stakeholders, and even within that group, you probably have them tiered out, mm -hmm. um, right? If you make consumer packaged goods, you probably have, you know, half a dozen folks that are close to the problem, and you and you better get one to one with them. Um, the 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 failure to do that is is likely to expand your problem. If you do that well, you're likely to be recruiting, you're likely to be recruiting influencers to speak with you. And I didn't say speak for you, I said speak with you. And, um, and I think that's really, really important. And I think if, if your plan has, has a B2B, if, if your company has a, has a big B2B uh, component, your, your response plan, your response communication plan has to account for how are we gonna do that one-to-one -one communication and how are we gonna do it quickly? Because those folks uh, need to know if they're gonna speak with you, they need to know um, what it is you're saying, what it is you're seeing and knowing uh, so that they can join you in that. The, in the, the other thing I would add to that is, is that in a B2B environment, <clears throat> a, a consumer companies spend a lot of time and a lot of money building fans. We heard a lot about fans upstairs yeah. earlier and, and how social media takes advantages of the fact that you have fan base, <laughs> your followers and people with whom you can you can distribute your content online. B2B companies don't typically have a lot of fans. They may have some followers, um, but not a lot of fans that are gonna redistribute a lot of their, a lot of their material. So, um, you know, w what you've gotta be aware of is, is how are people gonna get information and what, what's the likely scenario in which they're gonna be making a judgment about you? And it might not be through their social media feed. It might be more likely that they're gonna go out and get it themselves. If they're going to go out and get it themselves, where are they going to go? They're going to pick up the phone. They're going to call you. So, what are your what are your actual frontline salespeople doing in response to the uh, to, to to the crisis? What do their scripts look like? They're going to go to Google. They're going to go. They're going to go to Google and they're going to they're going to look up your company and they're going to say, "What's going? What what can I learn here? Do you have a dark website that informs me about what's happening? What are the other things that are being said about you on Google? Is going to inform them as well. So they're going to take. It's going to be much more of a of a of a pull that information rather than you pushing the information to them. So lastly, I want to just round out with with uh, in, uh, your top sort of picks on things to invest in for uh, twenty nineteen uh, to be prepared for a crisis. Yeah, I <clears throat> I said some of this at the front end. Uh, be be prepared to be mobile, and and be able to move really fast, which means not only the preparing your team that way, but actually having the, the right tools and, and the right equipment. Um, I, I think, maybe this is negative net, I'm usually really actually very optimistic considering my, my line of work. I think uh, people are gonna start to be looking at board members sooner in some of these incidents uh, than, than we have in the past. Um, I, I think this, uh, I, this fact that everyone is a publisher, we have to have at least minimal ability a minimal ability to be to be sort of you know in the in the multimedia world to be publishing on our own to be engaging on our own and um and i, I think that last one is i do think there's a little too much subjectivity in the way we assess risk and assign risk gee what could happen and how bad would it hurt um that is very minimally table stakes i think we've got to have data a databases and and really go beyond what you know what's outside the box and my best example of that is I don't think, I think when that situation hit United Airlines, uh, it's been a while now, a year and a half or so, two years ago, I, the time gets compressed. I don't think they ever thought that their brand was gonna be, and their market cap, for God's sake, was gonna be affected because they had a bad exchange with a guy on a plane had to, had to take him off. That was, a, that was a miserable thing that touches a few of those. Yeah, I, I would add, and maybe across all of these, is, is that the crisis will be watched live, online, <laughs> Uh, in real and time, <laughs> and um, and and that's just a reality of the world we live in that 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 people have access to it. I wanted to watch the uh, Venezuelan um, a border crossing over the weekend. I couldn't find it on television, so I went to Facebook. I went to Facebook Live. I found a feed out of Peru, I think it was, uh, that that was that was broadcasting it, and I didn't speak the language, so it was a hard time for me to understand what was happening. But I could see the pictures and follow it in real time, and I think. That's it, particularly an environment where there's there's just there's cameras everywhere. There's people with with uh, ability to report from everywhere and anywhere. It doesn't take a CNN crew to get there. Get there. Uh, That's our stuff.